The Un environment will come to order. There we go. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the subcommittee at any time. Welcome to all of you, especially to our witnesses, uh, to this hearing today, which is entitled Expanding the Role of States in EPA Rulemaking. I recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. I'm grateful to have all of you here for this hearing entitled Expanding the Role of States in EPA Rulemaking. The Tenth Amendment protects states from being bullied by the federal government. Instead of allowing complete and unchecked power at the federal level, the Constitution ensures that states retain their authority on issues not expressly defined. Unfortunately, the previous administration must have skimmed over that part of the Constitution, deciding instead to impose complete control over states and their economies. This was certainly the case with the Environmental Protection Agency. Far too often, states found themselves forced to comply with costly and unachievable environmental standards, all for little or no benefit. As the EPA gains new leadership, the states must be given a larger role on environmental policy and not cede any more authority to unelected bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. The EPA, under Obama, under President Obama, routinely overstepped its authority, promulgating unnecessarily stringent standards without regard to state abilities or local expertise. In implementing nationwide ozone standards, to use one significant example, the agency chose an uninformed, one-size-fits-all regulatory agenda without regard to the unique challenges each state may face. In October 2015, the EPA lowered the national ozone standard from 75 parts per billion to 70 parts per billion. Southwestern states like my home state of Arizona are unable to comply with the standard solely due to our geographic location, which the EPA conveniently ignores when issuing standards. Arizona experiences a slightly amount of naturally occurring ozone emissions, excuse me, a significant amount of naturally occurring ozone emissions, which contribute greatly to volatile organic compound emissions, or VOX. Power plants, oil refineries, industrial sources, and other stationary sources account for 1% of Arizona's VOC emissions. Yet this is not something the EPA readily admits or acknowledges. Although the EPA's shortcomings on setting ozone standards are reprehensible, the way this agency has dealt with the regional haze program is even more egregious. This rulemaking merely aims to increase the clarity and color the human eye can see when visiting national parks and other protecting, protected federal wilderness. You heard me correctly. The goal of this rule is not to improve human health in any way and does nothing to prevent environmental hazards. It is an ostensible aesthetic measure. And shockingly, implementing this rule would cost individual states hundreds of millions of dollars. When Congress enacted Hayes regulations, the original intent was to have states dictate how to implement the program. The EPA was tasked with giving guidance to states while at the same time granting them deference to decide how to implement the program. Congress envisioned a true partnership. Perhaps if the EPA had made an earnest effort to partner with states and truly listen to their feedback, Americans would not be paying the cost of hollow and ineffective regulations. Thankfully, the new EPA Administrator, Scott Pruitt, has expressed an intent to work with states in a cooperative manner to create positive change. This hearing will help aid this endeavor by giving state officials the opportunity to voice their state's needs. I hope this hearing will act as a step forward, excuse me, step forward and a step toward ensuring a true partnership between states and the federal government. Without objection, I'd like to enter to the record a written statement from the Wyoming Department of Environmental Quality discussing the important relationship of state environmental agencies in federal rulemaking. And I'll yield back uh, the balance of my time. And I now recognize the gentlewoman from Oregon, the ranking member, Mrs. Bonamici, for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of our witnesses for being here today. Before we talk about the topic that is the title of this hearing today, Expanding the Role of States in EPA Rulemaking, we need to discuss the basis of these rules themselves. The existence of the EPA and its core mission to protect human health and the environment stemmed from a failure of the states to safeguard their residents from pollution in the air, water, and soil. EPA's role as a federal environmental regulatory body was meant to provide an even playing field for all Americans, regardless of geography, because the health of our families is not something we can leave to chance. The mission of the EPA is to protect human health and the environment. 
And the agency's purpose clearly states that its efforts to protect Americans from significant risks should be based on the best available scientific information. As members of the Science Committee, it is important for us to focus on the oversight of the federal research undertaken by agencies in our jurisdiction. For the EPA, this means allowing the Office of Research and Development to continue its leading edge scientific research that forms the basis of agency actions, including rulemaking. The back to basics agenda that EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt has touted recently with a focus on environment, economy, and engagement appears to have little overlap with the agency's stated mission to protect human health and the environment. Further actions by both the EPA administrator and the Trump administration have shown an increased proclivity toward promoting industry interests over public health, whether by refusing to renew the terms of eligible members of the agency's board of scientific counselors or proposing to gut funding for the EPA's Office of Research and Development the office that conducts the research that forms the basis of environmental protections. This administration and my colleagues on the other side of the aisle in this committee are quick to forget the condition of our environment prior to the existence of the EPA, when pollution was pervasive in our air, water, and soil. Let me be clear, our work is not done. Just because we cannot see the pollution around us know that now that our rivers no longer catch fire and our cities are not as choked by smog, does not mean that the EPA can close up shop or retreat. In fact, we need the EPA now more than ever. The American people agree. During a recent call for comments on what EPA regulations to modify, repeal, or replace, thousands of Americans pleaded to keep in place environmental safeguards, with some even warning that we would be doomed to repeat our history if we dismantled existing protections. Although I'm concerned by the administration's broad actions against science across the agencies, I'm especially troubled by the specific EPA actions because of the seriousness of the agency's mission to protect the public from environmental risks. That's why I'm pleased that we have Dr. Swackhammer to, here today to highlight the scientific foundation of these environmental safeguards and the importance of continuing to press forward on scientific research, both internally at the EPA and additionally through grants. I look forward to a discussion starting today and I hope continuing into the future about the integral role that scientific inquiry plays in informing policy and risk at the EPA in order to keep our constituents safe and healthy in the communities we are all so honored to represent. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, thank the witnesses for being here today and Mr. Chairman, I would also like to ask for unanimous consent that a letter be introduced into the record. This letter was sent to EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt last week requesting additional details surrounding the decision to not renew the terms of nine eligible members of the EPA's Board of Scientific Counselors. It is signed by the ranking members of the Full Science, Space, and Technology Committee and the Energy and Commerce Committee, as well as the ranking members of their respective oversight and environment subcommittees. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And with that, I uh, look forward to the testimony and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. I now recognize the Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and also thanks to the witnesses for being here today. Mr. Chairman, the United States Constitution asserts that state governments retain power when not directly superseded by the federal government. This is explicitly stated in the Tenth Amendment. Unfortunately, during the previous administration, the relationship between the Environmental Protection Agency and state governments eroded to the point that states were micromanaged by the federal government at every turn, often at great detriment to their local economies. The EPA sought control over state interest and routinely downplayed state concerns in order to enforce a costly partisan agenda that did little to better the environment. For instance, when EPA regulations mandated that states create plans to meet environmental standards, the EPA routinely usurped these plans and created far stricter plans for states with little or no negotiation. This isn't the relationship our founding fathers envisioned when they created the Bill of Rights. This is the implementation of a unilateral environmental agenda. What's also troubling is that the regulations EPA proposed, finalized, and forced onto states during the previous administration were routinely shown to be based on suspect science. The EPA often cherry-picked what science to utilize and amazingly didn't even possess some of the data they supposedly used for regulations. 
Not surprisingly, the EPA has been broken for, for years. That's why the committee approved two important pieces of legislation this year, the Honest Act and the Science Advisory Board Reform Act. These bills, passed by the House and sent to the Senate, will promote scientific integrity and assure that scientific advice and counsel is no longer lopsided. I am encouraged that President Trump and Administrator Pruitt are working hard to return the EPA to its rightful place as an honest agency that isn't plagued by a one-sided agenda. Unfortunately, this is a big task. Even now, staff at the agency is working to undermine the President's authority by continuing to conspire with environmental allies of the past administration who want to impose costly, job-killing regulations on American taxpayers. Recently, science integrity officers at the EPA have scheduled a stakeholder meeting to discuss the agency's scientific integrity practices. The stakeholders invited to this closed, invitation-only meeting reads like a who's who of environmental activists with little diversity among viewpoints. It is clear that certain employees at the EPA continue to undermine the current administration and are doing so in near-secret meetings. A meeting like this should not take place without balanced representation of all stakeholders, or even better, the meeting should be open to all who wish to attend. Under the previous administration, science advisory panels and boards of the EPA were packed with experts of the same mindset, acting as a rubber stamp of the agency's agenda. These same experts also were found to be double dipping. They are routinely funded by EPA grant money, but then advise the agency on the same issues they were funded to examine. This is a clear conflict of interest. I am disappointed that some employees continue to push a secret one-sided agenda instead of working with the administration. This administration is returning EPA to its rightful agenda of relying on good science, not cherry-picked or non-existent science. And I applaud the work of Administrator Pruitt and look forward to working with him to make sure regulations are providing the most benefit to our states and their citizens. With that, I again look forward to hearing from our witnesses today and yield back the balance of my time. I now recognize, recognize the ranking member of the full committee uh, for a statement, Representative Johnson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and our distinguished ranking member and witnesses. Environmental protections that limit damage to the environment and protect the public from toxic exposure should be based on solid scientific evidence. Five decades ago, a Republican president established the Environmental Protection Agency to ensure that this was the case. Some of us still remember that the EPA was created because the states were not doing a good job in regulating private industries and in safeguarding the health and safety of their residents. In the years and decades before EPA was established, rivers were literally causing, catching fire because of flammable chemicals dumped into them. Smog engulfed the air in certain cities, exacerbating health ailments, and children played in urban areas immersed with toxic chemicals. Richard Nixon established the EPA to assist state environmental agencies by providing them with the scientific research necessary to successfully carry out their mission to protect the public. He believed a federal scientific agency was needed to help the nation address critical environmental issues because he knew they could not be successfully addressed with each state acting on their own. In his message to Congress in July of 1970, President Nixon said the EPA was needed to make a coordinated attack on the pollutants which debase the air, we breathe, the water we drink, and the land we grow our food. Certainly, environmental problems still exist today. However, as a nation, together we have made steady progress in addressing them. These achievements have been made by relying on credible environmental science that has helped to enlighten policymakers and politicians alike in order to help develop constructive policies and reasonable regulations to protect the public. But abandoning these, this responsibility will not help protect the environment or improve the public's health. 
Rather, it will turn back the clock more than 50 years. Many of the proposed environmental policies and regulations coming from this administration and the Science Committee majority have already put us on a road back to a time when industries polluted, unimpeded, the public suffered, and politicians stayed silent. I am concerned that today the Trump administration is attempting to silence federal scientists and offer alternative facts rather than scientific evidence. The decision by EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt earlier this month to not renew nine of the 18 members of the agency's Board of Scientific Counselors is just the latest example of this administration's effort to silence scientists. The EPA has also scrubbed references to climate change from its websites, and the administrator recently ignored the research finding of EPA's own scientists who recommended banning a toxic chemical and instead sided with the insecticide manufacturer. We are fortunate that today Dr. Deborah Smackhammer is here to provide us with her perspective on these unfortunate events. Dr. Smackhammer is a professor emeritus of science, technology, and public policy, as well as a professor of emerita, uh, a professor emerita of environmental health scientist at the University of Minnesota, bringing a wealth of scientific expertise to the table. She is also the current chair of EPA's Board of Scientific Counselors and the former chair of EPA's Science Advisory Board. Although she's testifying today in her, in her personal capacity as a scientist expert and not representing any of the EPA's Science Advisory Board, I am glad she has decided not to stay silent. I look forward to hearing her perspective on how the federal government can rely on science to develop appropriate environmental policies and regulations. In closing, I'd like to remind my colleagues that the EPA was created by a Republican president to preserve, environment, to preserve the environment and protect the public health, not the profits of private corporations. The EPA's fundamental mission, however, appears to be under attack. The efforts to alter EPA's mission, downgrade its legal authority, and silence its scientists will endanger the public and threaten the environment against the public's will. However, science has proven repeatedly that science cannot be silenced. Scientific facts are supported by evidence, not opinions. Distorting or dismissing scientific facts do not alter scientific knowledge. I hope that this committee, this Congress, and this administration can get back to the basic principles of good governance, where science forms a solid bedrock that helps to educate policymakers and inform their public policy choices. I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses, and I thank you, Mr. Biggs, and I yield back. Thank you. Let me introduce our witnesses today. I have a great panel here with us, and our first witness today is uh, Mr. Misael Cabrera, Director of the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. Director Cabrera is a registered professional engineer. He received his bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of Arizona. Our next witness will be Ms. Becky Keough, Director of the Arkansas Department of Environmental Quality. Ms. Keough received her bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from the University of Arkansas. And our final witness today is Dr. Deborah Swackhammer, Professor Emeritus at the Hubert H. Humphrey School of Public Affairs and Professor Emeritus of Emer Environmental, Health Society, excuse me, Environmental Health Sciences at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Swackhammer received her bachelor's degree from Grinnell College and her master's and PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I now recognize Mr. Cabrera for five minutes to present his testimony. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, um, I am greatly appreciative of the opportunity to offer testimony today. As we discuss expanding the role of states in U.S. Environmental Protection Agency rulemaking, we should also discuss its corollary, reducing the role of EPA in state rulemaking. Let me explain. The Clean Air Act calls for states to prepare implementation plans when national air quality standards are not being met. 
the state implementation plans contain state-specific rules, rules that are developed through extensive stakeholder involvement and designed for environmental protection and local effectiveness. When EPA rejects a state plan or when it issues its own federal implementation plan, it effectively coerces states to write state rules in the specific way that EPA sees fit. One example of this is what I like to call the EPA Regional Haze Maze. In 1990, Congress established the Regional Haze Program calling for states to develop plans for reasonable progress towards the national visibility goal set in 1977. Congress also established authority for visibility transport commissions and mandated the Grand Canyon Visibility Transport Commission. In 1992, EPA established the commission addressing specific parks and wilderness areas in a nine state region made up of eight governors, four tribal leaders, four ex-official federal organizations with the Arizona governor serving as the chair. Once established, the commission formed working committees of over 200 experts in air quality, regulatory programs, and economics. In 1996, the commission issued a final report with recommendations to EPA. At that point, EPA should have implemented the commission's recommendations. Instead, we were led further into the EPA regional haze maze. In 1997, EPA proposed regulations that totally ignored the commission's findings. In 1998, upset Western governors provided guidance to EPA on how to implement the commission recommendations and the Senate held oversight hearings. In 1999, EPA issued revised regulations with two programs, a general program for any state and an optional program for the commission states. In 2004, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Oregon were the first states in the nation to submit regional haze plans. The next few years included court challenges to EPA rules and states trying to appease the desires of EPA. In 2009, EPA published a finding that 34 states had failed to submit state plans by the regulatory deadline and that three states, including Arizona, had failed to submit required elements of the plans. In 2011, Arizona determined that, the impl that implementing the regional haze requirements under the optional program would not be feasible and submitted a replacement plan under the general program. In 2011, Earth Justice sued EPA for failing to act on the plans. EPA and Earth Justice settled, requiring EPA to act on a submitted state plan or issue a federal plan. In 2012, EPA partially disapproved Arizona's submittal and issued a federal plan for several facilities in Arizona. EPA's plan had an estimated cost of over $500 million. The worst part of the EPA regional haze maze is that after 20 years of extensive stakeholder meetings and negotiations, multiple commission reports, two state plans, four lawsuits, a federal plan that would cost over $500 million, after all that, the modeled improvement to visibility would not be perceivable to the human eye. After, <clears throat> let me repeat that. EPA's insistence on controls that cost over $500 million would not have created a perceivable visibility difference in the Grand Canyon State. Given that states now have mature regulatory programs, unlike 40 years ago, and technical expertise, EPA should give deference to competent state regulators who develop state plans and state-specific rules. Only in rare instances where minimum criteria are not met should EPA reject state plans or issue a federal plan. In short, we should absolutely expand state involvement in EPA rulemaking and we should reduce EPA involvement in state rulemaking via the state implementation planning process set forth in the Clean Air Act. In closing, I would like to mention that I am very encouraged by EPA Administrator Pruitt's statements regarding a renewal of collaborative federalism and the Environmental Council of States' work on the same issue. Thank you very much. I'll open to any questions. Thank you. Director Keogh. Chairman Smith, 
Chairman Biggs, ranking members, and members of the committee, I am Becky Keough. I hail from the great state of Arkansas and bring greetings from your former colleague and now my boss, Governor Asa Hutchinson. Since taking on the humbling and exciting role of serving in Governor Hutchinson's cabinet as director of the Department of Environmental Quality and now including our Office of Energy, I have been a vocal proponent of returning environmental rulemaking to its constitutional roots, something known as cooperative federalism. Unfortunately, over the past eight years, that once noble partnership that balanced state and federal responsibility and accountability has morphed into something better described as coercive federalism, where the state is more pawn than partner. In Arkansas, we have been authorized to administer every program that the EPA makes eligible for state delegation, but despite that delegated authority and our status as a co-sovereign, the EPA treated us and other similarly situated states as petulant children, with the EPA acting as a helicopter mom of the worst order. Um, only days before Administrator Pruitt took the reins of EPA, correspondence between EPA and the Department of Justice referred to Arkansas as recalcitrant litigant, and at times we were. It was our only course left available to states that would not assimilate or accept the EPA overreach. However, I am pleased to report we are amidst a season of change. In short time, Administrator Pruitt has been in place. We are seeing extraordinary change in the environmental landscape. The state struggle and promise of progress is well illustrated using a story frame penned by Steve Stracely, the principal of Catholic High School for Boys in Little Rock, Arkansas. Some of you may have heard of this school where Congressman French Hill's son attends when it entered the national spotlight this year for turning away helicopter parents. On the first day of school, stop signs were placed on the school's entrance that read, if you are dropping off your son's forgotten lunch, books, homework, equipment, etc., please turn around and exit the building. Your son will learn to problem solve in your absence. It is not accidental that I've chosen this frame to for my testimony with the story of Principal Stracely's year-end letter. In this letter, he also recalled a hike he took with his children along Tennessee's fiery gizzard trail, where he noticed a phenomenon that occurred again and again, trees growing out of boulders along the creek. He noticed these were not twigs, but rather instead were three-foot diameter thick trees that reached several stories into the sky. He noted it was curious that boulder trees were as tall as the others further into the bank, but the root systems were wrapped around rocks that served as foundation. Fate had deposited seeds on top of the rocks, and these seeds had grown over the decades. He continued, you can't help but think those trees, as they grew, looked longingly at the comrades on fertile ground that had no visible problems as they sprouted. The other trees were on solid soil and their root depth was uninhibited. But boulder trees had to figure a way around obstacles. They had to wrap their roots around the boulder, envelop it, and work painstakingly to reach the soil. Impressively, it, these trees must have struggled as they leaned far over the creek and into the sunlight that otherwise blocked by better fed vegetation. Boulder trees have an unfair life. They start in thin dirt on a top of a rock. But those trees persevered. Instead of cursing the rock, they made those rocks into the firmest foundations and reached ever more for sunlight that would nourish them, that would help them grow. Reaching for the light is important, and that is why I'm testifying to you today. We states have wrapped our roots around rocks, reached over the creek and into the sun. Over the past decade, we withstood sparse soil and overcast skies. We, like boulder trees, wrapped ourselves around what held us back enveloped it, smothered it with strength, and used it as pedestal for engagement and a rallying cry for perseverance. Often with limited resources, we state sought ways to be efficient in affecting environmental outcomes and to be flexible with the ability to flourish with less. While the bank trees flourished in their regulated growth and uniformity, we learned that progress and process were not synonymous. A prolonged permit yields protracted protection. We observed firsthand the futility of attempting to turn a boulder tree into a bank tree. State and federal differences should define us, not divide us. As we move forward into the light, know that we boulder trees, while unique in our appearance and route to soil and sun, are no less mighty than the bank trees. In fact, the state struggle to grow has enhanced our strength. The country's landscape is enriched when we can recognize the beauty of forest and trees. We look forward to working with our federal partners as we reach for the light together. Several specific paths 
have been offered in my written comments that will return us to our constitutional roads and where states and EPRs are partners in planting of progress and harvesting of success. And I offer a final optimistic prologue. In a personal meeting with Administrator Pruitt, he assured me that EPA will seek new paths of partnership, promising that the future ain't what it used to be. I am encouraged that we states will be allowed to implement and execute legally sound and scientifically informed environmental policy from our firmly rooted, rock solid foundation as opposed to shifting federal sands of late. If given the opportunity to lean toward the light together, we can achieve success of biblical proportion. Thank you so much and I look forward to your questions. Thank, thank you. Dr. Swackheimer for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Biggs, Ranking Member Bonamici, and distinguished committee members. My name is Deb Swackhammer, and I'm a former professor from the University of Minnesota, where I held appointments in the Humphrey School of Public Affairs and in the School of Public Health. I'm trained as an environmental chemist, chemist and I have worked on environmental policy for the state of Minnesota. I have served as chair of the U.S. EPA Science Advisory Board, and I currently serve as chair of EPA's Board of Scientific Counselors. That said, I speak to you today as an environmental science and policy expert, and not on behalf of the U.S. EPA or the state of Minnesota. My perspectives and statements are mine alone. The hearing today is to explore the tension between st states and EPA regarding env environmental regulation. My comments today are to underscore the critically important role of science in environmental decision making, regardless of whether it takes place at the state or the federal level. Our federal environmental statutes from the 1970s set up a national regulatory framework that honors and empowers the roles of states. The federal role is to ensure consistency across multi-jurisdictional watersheds and airsheds and to establish a minimum bar of environmental quality that allows our citizens to safely drink our water, eat our fish, and breathe our air. The state's role is to implement this framework because they know their states better than Washington, D.C. This framework works for a number of reasons. First, we are well aware that air and water do not respect or follow geopolitical boundaries. Second, this framework works because of the inclusion of robust science. The essence of environmental protection is the protection of our citizens' health. To protect public health, you must have clean air and safe drinking water. In other words, you must have a clean environment. To achieve this, one must establish acceptable exposures of pollutants using the best scientific evidence available. Thus, science is the bedrock, the foundation, of human health and environmental protection. This scientific foundation must be independent of politics and must be robust. Our federal EPA and our state environmental agencies must have the best available science or they will not be protecting public health. Without science supporting environmental decision making at any level, public health loses. Environmental issues are complex and thus the science to address them requires many disciplines and perspectives. Much of the scientific evidence that is needed to protect public health can be done more efficiently and effectively at the federal level where they can take advantage of national laboratories, multidisciplinary scientific capacity, and access to national and international scientific communities. However, the President's proposed 2018 budget reduces investment in EPA science programs, an ominous indication that the foundation of science to support policy is being marginalized by the current administration. If not EPA, then who will provide the needed scientific evidence? There is no indication of how the scientific capacity would be replaced. In fact, pass-through programmatic dollars to the states are also cut in the proposed budget. Cutting environmental protection funds to the states will further decrease science-based policy and the state's capacity to produce sound policy. States will not be able to make up the difference. This results in a double lose-lose situation for public health. EPA's job is not finished. The proposed cuts in science budgets and the marginalization of science and environmental protection have been justified by some that we have done enough, that these investments are no longer necessary. Nothing could be further from the truth. We have made tremendous progress in the improvement of our environment and in reducing illness, but it is a myth that we can coast on these successes. Four out of 10 of our nation's lakes and rivers do not meet basic water quality standards. It is estimated that more than 200,000 people die prematurely each year in the United States 
as a result of air pollution exposures. These exposures cost the U.S. economy over $100 million per year in health costs. Marginalizing science will make these numbers worse. The majority of U.S. citizens do not want to go backward. What is, at what is at stake if there is a decline in support of science at the federal and state levels? Should we follow this path that will lead to a decline in public health, a decline in our community's health, and put our country at a competitive disadvantage? It erodes the future health and well-being of our children and our grandchildren. Investing in and maintaining our preeminence in environmental science and ensuring its use in sound environmental policy will put us on a much better path. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I thank each of the witnesses for their testimony. I appreciate it. Members are reminded that committee rules limit questioning to five minutes, and I recognize myself for five minutes. Director Cabrera, uh, can you tell me how much work do states put into creating their SIPs and whether you think there might be a disincentive for states to use their resources to create these plans when the EPA uh, tends to replace them easily with federal implementation plans. And we have up the original Hayes uh, illusion, that, uh, the modeling that you alluded to in your statement. I, I can tell you that um, in the states, uh, uh, we look forward to developing the state implementation plans because we feel that state implementation plans are better than federal implementation plans 100% of the time. Um, I can also say that uh, it is a bit disheartening uh, when uh, we develop these plans through extensive modeling, extensive scientific study and calculation, uh, only to have uh, EPA officials uh, uh, from our region um, nitpick and uh, really uh, question all of our analysis. Uh, in the end, uh, we're put in a position where uh, we I have to uh, comply with EPA's demands because they always have the ability to reject our plans and then issue a federal plan. So it puts the states in a, a very awkward position of, of we have to comply uh, or else we're faced with the threat of a federal implementation plan. Well, Arizona's ab ability to comply with ozone standards is often hindered by naturally occurring weather events such as dust storms. These dust storms, for instance, blow dust from rural areas to cities, which result in those areas exceeding the national ambient air quality standards. EPA has an exceptional events exemption to discount for such naturally occurring events. In your opinion, does the exceptional events exemption work in practice? And what are the problems with the execution of this uh, exemption? So for dust exceptional events, um, the state of Arizona was a leader across the nation in developing a streamlined approach to making those demonstrations. Uh, in other words, uh, when there is a major wind uh, event that creates a lot of dust in the air, it is inappropriate to regulate businesses uh, for something that nature did. As a leader in that area, uh, we shared our process uh, with EPA um, they then implemented an exceptional events rule. Unfortunately, they added to our streamline process uh, what's called mitigation measures. So according to those rules, uh, which were modeled on Arizona's initial efforts, uh, we now have to figure out a way to mitigate for nature. And that is a very difficult thing to do. And I would um, uh, uh, state that it's, it's not really uh, scientifically possible. In, in particular with these dust storms that uh, we get to see in the Phoenix area, uh, can you describe how big they are and, uh, and how the local news seems to be, be able to understand it, but the uh, federal administrators don't? One of the things that's a bit disappointing is when all the major news media pick up on what is called a haboob, which is a hundred plus foot high wall of dust that looks a lot like the movie from The Mummy. Um, uh, and everybody understands that it's a natural event. Uh, to have EPA then uh, require us to spend uh, tens of thousands of dollars producing a document to 
uh, explain what everybody else uh, saw and documented through the news media. So uh, in that respect, it's a bit wasteful to have to uh, explain an exceptional event that everybody considers obvious. Can you speak to the impact of downward ozone on Arizona areas that are currently in non-attainment? Um, particularly, what's the greatest contributor to ozone in Arizona, and do the current EPA standards account for that? EPA's own emissions uh, calculations suggest that uh, in certain areas of the state, especially in Yuma, Arizona, which will be found to be in non-attainment for the new ozone standard, um, the overall proportion of ozone comes from uh, uh, either California, Mexico, or other international sources. And so it puts us in a very awkward spot of applying regulation on a community that did not create the pollution. Uh, and it's a community in Yuma County that already has a very high unemployment rate. And so what we're doing in effect is uh, rewarding upwind states like California uh, with longer compliance time frames because they're in extreme non-attainment and then opposing more restrictive regulation on counties that did not create the pollution in the first place. Thank you, and I, I'm just about out of time, so I'm going to uh, uh, go to Ranking Member uh, Bonamici. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Swackhammer, nine of the 18 members of the EPA's Board of Scientific Counselors had their terms expire on April 27th, and all nine of those members were previously told that their names would be submitted to the EPA management for renewal to serve a second three-year term on the board, and that had been the normal practice in the past. But a week later, all nine board members were told that their terms would not be renewed, and uh, apparently an EPA PA spokesman said that Administrator Pruitt wanted more industry representatives to serve on the board. So I know you're the chair of the board, and the, but I know you're here in your private capacity, but will you please um, answer uh, a couple of questions briefly from your uh, perspective, and then I have another uh, question. Uh, first, were you surprised about the decision to not renew the terms of those nine members, and were you given any explanation about it? Uh, uh, Chairwoman Bonamici, uh, we, were, um, we were all a little surprised, those of us that sit on the committee. I was surprised simply because it, is, um, it, is, it was expected that those terms would be renewed. Um, typically, terms are, are renewed unless there is some reason, such as the expertise is no longer needed or the person chooses to stay. Were not, you given not an impressed. explanation? Um, no, other than the, um, what, what we all saw in the press and what came out from, the spokes, uh, from uh, Administrator Pruitt's spokesman, who said that they wanted to um, um, not just renew a previous administration's uh, appointments and that they wanted to um, broaden a, the a more of a, a regulatory, um, the regulated community uh, involvement in the committee. So now it's my understanding that two board members resigned in protest after the dismissal. So now instead of 18 members, there's only five, including you. Are you concerned about uh, the future of the board in, in light of that? Um, let me uh, just clarify those numbers. So nine members of the 18 had served one term and were expected to be renewed. All nine had requested renewal. The um, four members had rotated off because they finished a second term. So they were, they were done with their term limit. They were rotated off. The two members that you more recently may have heard about were a sub members of a subcommittee. So um, the, um, the nine plus the four um, left us with five members left on the um, Board of Scientific Counselors. Um, I, I'm obviously concerned. My, my committee is no longer um, populated, so I'm, I'm anxious to make sure that it gets repopulated as quickly as possible. Um, and my understanding is that that's, that's part of what the administration is planning to do, is to repopulate this committee. Thank you. And uh, my, my second question is uh, changing topics a bit. I fear that the Trump administration's actions to date and planned policies will lead to some public health tragedies in individual states and across the nation. The committee majority's focus on expanding the role of states while limiting the EPA's role in developing science-based safeguards is also troubling. For example, the administration is proposing to cut the EPA's budget by more than 30 percent, but they also want to cut grants to states. Five state environmental agencies depend on the federal government for more than half their budgets, and more than half of all state environmental agencies rely on the federal government for at least a quarter of their budgets. 
These cuts will have devastating consequences across the United States. Uh, attempts to increase the burden on states to hold steady or improve their commitment to public health and environmental protections will simply not be possible. Many of us came from state legislator legislatures and we know that the budget challenges already. The end result will be less federal oversight, fewer scientific studies on environmental hazards, and more damage to the environment and public health. You mentioned in your testimony also, air and water know no state boundaries. Uh, so can, from a, can you, from a scientific perspective, do you agree that turning over more regulatory authority to states while scaling back the role of the APA puts public health at greater risk? And, and if so, can you tell us how and why? My concern is that the science that's needed to develop good environmental policy, whether it's done at the state or federal level, will um, simply not be available um, if, uh, if the path that we're going down currently uh, continues to be followed. Um, I am not going to comment whether, whether states or the federal government should be making these standards or regulations um, with all respect to my two colleagues here. It's more that I want to make sure that science is used to make sure that the states have the adequate science that they need and that the federal government has the adequate science that they need to move forward and to protect human health. If we don't have the science, we're not going to protect public health. I appreciate that. I, I, I do want to note, it's my understanding that uh, in his confirmation hearing, uh, Administrator Pruitt had suggested that he may uh, disallow or at least review a waiver to allow states to issue more stringent rules like California with their auto emissions, which I, I find uh, to be uh, blatantly inconsistent. And before I yield back, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask uh, for unanimous consent that a bipartisan letter be introduced into the record. This is a letter to Administrator Pruitt expressing concern about the dismissal of several, several members of the Board of Scientific Counselors at the EPA. Without objection. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've, I've never met anyone uh, who wants to have dirty air or dirty water uh, for themselves, uh, their, their family, or future generations. And I've always pretty much taken the position that the government closest to the people works best. It's usually the most efficient. I'm a strong believer in the idea that people who actually live and work in an area are best uh, positioned to lead efforts to protect their environment. Uh, local leaders have firsthand knowledge of the unique challenges their environment faces and are invested in the health of sustain and sustainability of their surroundings in a way that bureaucrats and far-off government offices never could be. Uh, unfortunately, there are those who think Washington has a monopoly on both good ideas and compassion and stewardship for the environment, and who would think to seek to displace uh, the state and local role in environmental policymaking. Uh, to me, I think that would be a mistake. Of course, I understand the need for cooperation at all, all levels of government for maximally effective government stewardship and environmental stewardship. However, I'm concerned that during the past administration, we moved from federal cooperation to coercion. Uh, it's essential that we get back to common ground, I believe. Uh, Mr. Keogh, can you please describe what uh, cooperative federalism means and how this model may have been undermined? Thank you. Um, we at the state of Arkansas have seen a number of programs where uh, the cooperation that was helpful to the state to result in an efficient program was undermined through federal intervention and federal plans similar to what our, my colleague from Arizona has experienced in that regional haze maze. We've also seen uh, areas where we've been second-guessed on our science, similarly in uh, SO2 designations that we're recently going through, as well as even in our water quality programs where duplication results in redundancy and uh, use of data that's not even vetted through uh, peer review. So we, we are concerned that we do not have the right relationship with EPA and we're working strongly with this administration and we appreciate their support to work with us to find a more efficient, effective delivery, not only with states but also with our local partners. I like to say local governments, private business, and citizens can be meaningful partners and not considered polluters. Thank you. Uh, thank you. H how do you think we get back to this cooperative federalism approach? 
Well, I think it's important to have the conversation we're having today, let states inform science policy early, and work to streamline decision making. Um, we at the states collectively and individually have been working on a blueprint to give specific recommendations to the administrator, and we hope that that will benefit them. Um, we want to build science into the process. We understand there's an important role for EPA to play, and we want to talk about those roles and responsibilities, not only of government, but of those outside government to effect positive solutions in what is now a 45-year-old program. I'm ready to let my children grow up and leave the house. I think they can do as well or even improve on what I've accomplished at, in government, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to this new day in environmental progress. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Cabrera, could you give us an example from your experience where a likely well-intentioned federal regulation has actually caused more harm or difficulty uh, for state environmental managements than any benefit it might have helped? So I think that, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, I believe that the Regional Haze Program is a perfect example. Um, the Regional Haze Program is well-intentioned and we do not disagree with it. Um, uh, uh, President Grant first established uh, Yellowstone National Park for everybody to be able to uh, enjoy it, and, and we believe that having clear visibility is important. Having said that, uh, when EPA completely ignored uh, the Grand Canyon Transport Commission's recommendations, uh, what it did is it put us on a, a lengthy 20-year uh, process uh, that resulted in no visible improvement to the Grand Canyon. So after 20 years, uh, four lawsuits, uh, lots of activity, lots of voice by both the state and the federal government and lots of stakeholders, uh, the result is no visible improvement. And so we think that EPA's engagement in that arena uh, has not produced the desired result. Could you once again state the cost of that project? The estimated cost was over $500 million for controls put on power plants in the vicinity of the Grand Canyon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Christ. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. S am I saying it right? Swackhammer? Thank you. Um, so you taught at the University of Minnesota? Yes, I did for almost 30 years. Wonderful. Um, I represent Florida's 13th congressional district. It includes St. Petersburg, uh, Clearwater. It is a peninsula, uh, literally on the peninsula of Florida. Uh, so our shorelines are impacted by severe storms and constant coastal erosion. And as a result, there are real concerns by my constituents uh, about tourism, which is how many of us make a living in uh, that part of the state. And we are worried that the erosion may wash it away bit by bit by bit. So my question would be, uh, how important is a federal agency, such as the EPA, in giving aid to states to understand the science of climate change and helping them to cope with realities of climate change that are already there? That's a great question. Uh, it, it's really clearly up to the states to be acting on their own uh, catastrophes, their, their own issues, whether they're slow-moving or fast-moving emergencies. Um, however, it's unusual for one state to have the scientific exper expertise to address a crisis or to address something that is a, um, a complicated problem. How that erosion occurs, what the impacts are to the coastal zones in Florida, combine that with the nutrient problems that are, are carried with the soil that erodes, um, you end up with a problem that is very, very complex, and it's, it does require a large um, multidisciplinary effort of science to understand that. Then you can actually mitigate it or implement some change, and that, def that definitely happens at the state level. But to do the science to understand the issue, to come up with mitigation strategies, to come up with policies that may alter the, um, the insult that's occurring, that requires robust science that, for the most part, I'm not saying all science has to be done at the federal level by any means, but the, the basic the basic science that leads to an understanding of these issues is largely done at the federal level, and the reason is is that the federal level 
it has access to resources. It has access to many more laboratories, access to many more people from many more disciplines, and it has access to the international community, which also does some pretty good science. So it's, it's, it's that play between understanding the issue at the f using federal resources and then working with states to actually fix it. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I come from a state where my successor as governor uh, is reported to have uh, not wanted people in his administration to use the term climate change. So I think there's an extra overlay as it relates to my constituents to be able to have another agency that can be brought to bear uh, to help protect us and uh, for future generations of Floridians, let alone Americans. In your opinion, would expanding the role of the states in the EPA rulemaking enhance or hurt our ability to respond to climate change? Um, I'm not sure I'm going to directly answer that question as as uh, as you would as you might want. I you I have would, that right. <laughs> I think that um, as long as the science is behind the actions taken, um, whether it occurs at a state or federal level, is, um, is is the most important thing. But if you take something like climate change, which is larger than any state. Um, the impact on coastal zones goes all up and down the, the eastern seaboard, the Atlantic coastal areas, um, up and down other coasts, including the Great Lakes. Um, we can't view this as a single state issue. And so the more the states cooperate with the federal government on understanding these broad issues and these, these bigger threats, that's where the federal government role really shines. If, um, if it's a smaller issue that really just is held within a state, that's a different issue, then the state can deal with it. But many of our environmental problems are, um, don't follow state boundaries. They're bigger than states. Um, they, there's air sheds involved. There's watersheds involved. Uh, there's, in some cases, international boundaries involved. And so it, it, uh, there's not a, a set answer that states should do more or the feds should do more. It's really that these problems are very big and complex, and they need, you need to harness the best possible science you possibly can to address them. Thank you. I, I must confess that my uh, past uh, brings a bit of a bias to how I look at these issues. When I was both Attorney General of Florida and then Governor of Florida, we dealt with some significant environmental issues, hurricanes among them, like a ton of them while I was Attorney General. And then while I was Governor, the BP oil spill. So I was delighted to be able to have the federal government, my American government, come to the aid of my state of Florida in both of those circumstances, uh, without which uh, we would have been in a bad place. So thank you for your testimony, Doctor. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Babin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I want to tell all the witnesses we appreciate you being here. Thank you. Uh, there was something, I just wanted to get some stuff straight uh, in my mind on the Board of Scientific Counselors. There's been some controversy and discussion on this. and. I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Swackhammer, uh, if you don't mind, at the end of April the nine, uh, excuse me, at the end of April, nine members of the BOSC finished three-year terms, right? One three-year term. One three-year term. Did the EPA solicit nominees to fill positions on the BOSC before these members finished their three-year terms? Um, I really can't speak to that other than I know there was not a public call because I would have seen the Federal Register notice. So I don't really know what, um, what was the intention of, of EPA inside EPA at that time. Okay, well I think the answer was yes. EPA solicited nominees for these positions and received hundreds of recommendations. If, if I could correct that, that wasn't based on a new call for solicitations. That's based on the fact that when they populate um, any of their advisory boards, they take nominations, and those nominations stay in place um, over time, and then they can rely on those nominations also when they go to fill new positions. But that wasn't based on a recent call. Okay, well, as I understand it, EPA's Office of Research and Development officials recommended the renewal of the nine members of the BOSC without reviewing hundreds of nominations that they had received. Is that, are you aware of that? Um, my understanding is that the Office of Research and Development recommended that those nine members that were already members of BOSC be, um, be, re be renewed. That's right, but there were hundreds of nominations that were recommended. Um, there, were nominations, there were nominations uh, that had been received by the agency over a period of time. 
and I can't speak to when those nominations came in, um, but they would have been solicited uh, uh, some time ago. Well, I think Administrator Pruitt had asked for, for nominations, and they came in from various sectors of the industries around. Um, and, uh, he's not official, he's not issued an official request for nominations to my knowledge. Well, if, if I'm not mistaken, they have hundreds of, of uh, recommendations and applications. And, and they would have come in before he was administrator, just to be clear. Okay. Well, let me, let me just understand this. Uh, instead of rubber stamping the renewal of members of the BOSC, a decision was made to review the credentials of hundreds of individuals nominated to be on the board, including members up for renewal, and then choose who would serve a three-year term, whether it be a new term or whether it would be someone who was reappointed on the BOSC. Why would such an open and honest process be an issue to you? Um, so let me clarify also, I think that the process of selecting members to serve on any of the advisory boards at EPA is an open uh, and competitive process. I would hope so. Um, it absolutely, in my experience, has been. Um, I'm not part of, uh, as chair of either of the committees that I've served on, I've not participated in the selection process, but I do know how the nomination process works, and it's very transparent and it's very fair. Um, I believe that um, Administrator Pruitt's intention is to continue to do that process, and we will repopulate this, uh, this committee. Okay, well, I, I think as far as a time, let me... Let me ask you this, the next BOSC meeting is scheduled for August, is that not, not correct? That's a subcommittee meeting that is indeed okay. scheduled for August. So is there enough time, there seems to be enough time for the BOSC to be fully staffed up based on uh, a large pool of, of these nominees, isn't that correct as well? I, I believe that EPA staff will have to work very diligently to, to get enough members to, uh, to fill out the rest of the, um, the, the vacancies. Uh, but yes, it's quite possible. Three months, you don't think three months is enough time to get this done then? Um, typically, there's quite a vetting process. Once nominations are received, then there is a lot of vetting and a lot of uh, review of conflict of interest issues, financial issues, uh, obviously expertise. They want to get a committee that has a, the, the correct balance of expertise, broad expertise. And so there's a lot of review that goes into, into play looking at the scientific background of the scientists, looking at their publications, looking to see if they have an esteemed record, looking to see if their expertise matches what is needed for EPA. So there's a whole lot of vetting that takes place um, in between the nomination process and the request to join the committee process. But there's no rule that says we have to rubber stamp uh, the uh, a second not. term for everybody that sits a on it, Absolutely right? not. And I didn't mean to imply that okay. there is a rubber stamp that goes on. Again, if a member is not contributing or if a member is, uh, their expertise is no longer needed, then uh, often they are asked not to. Um, not to ask for renewal or not to agree to renewal. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Swackhammer. And I yield back the balance of my time, which is zero. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct, sir. Uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Swackhammer, you said there are 200,000 people die each year from air pollution. Die prematurely. But still, it's 200,000 people die from air pollution. That's correct. I've got um, the top 10 leading causes of death in the U.S., and it's not listed among any of them. The closest thing that I can come to that might be pneumonia, and there's 50-something thousand people. Uh, I don't think you can attribute... Uh, Air pollution is the exposure. Actually, the illnesses that cause the death are what you're probably looking at. So well, you heart disease, air pollution heart disease and lung disease, respiratory disease are, um, are those that are caused by air pollution. You're quoting one study from 2013 from MIT. No, I'm, uh, actually I'm quoting the, the World Health Organization that just completed a very large study. I saw that all. too. Okay. Um, That's what I'm quoting. I, I think um, it calls into question, though, the use of data. And I also wonder, do you, do you feel like you're entitled to another term? On the entitled? No, I don't think anyone on, on the... You think, no, I do not You don't entitled. think it makes sense for uh, uh, Administrator Pruitt to have the opportunity to populate his committees and his advisory boards with the people that, that he wants to put through a vetting process to see if he can improve the quality of the, of, of the boards or, or advisory 
groups that, that he, he wants to work with? He absolutely has that authority. Then this shouldn't be an issue. Um, so I'm going to ask Dr. I would say that it's just an unusual, an unusual selection, that's all. Well, maybe in the last eight years, but, um, but I think that he has every right to make a decision on who he wants to have advising the EPA. He absolutely does. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cabrera, uh, I've watched what's going on the last few years of the EPA. When the EPA was created, it was created with the understanding of cooperative federalism in that Congress would pass the law, the EPA would write the rule, and then the states would do the implementation with broad latitude as long as they achieve the objectives. Do you believe that that is still the operational dynamic that exists today? I believe, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I, I believe that um, early in the history of environmental protection, um, it is true that in, that the states uh, sometimes lack the expertise to implement well. But that was 40 years ago. And in the today, uh, we can implement well. We can um, uh, write rules. We can uh, do the science. We can uh, estimate emissions. Uh, we can protect our water, our soil, and our air. And I think that uh, EPA perhaps uh, has uh, I'm not caught up with the times and understood uh, that uh, in the today, states are well equipped. We have mature programs uh, that are technically competent, uh, and, and I, I don't think that EPA has recognized in every case uh, that the states uh, can uh, implement environmental laws well, uh, and in fact, in many cases, better. I, I think you might have added that they usurp state authority in many cases to, um, to implement the laws. Um, and, and I'll give you a, a case in point is the ozone rule, uh, which is a bigger issue in Arkansas, I think, perhaps, than in Arizona. It's certainly a big issue in Alabama. Is that, uh, and we had Administrator McCarthy, uh, I, I think, before this committee, and, and I asked her point blank about uh, the new ozone rule, which will be arguably the most expensive environmental regulation ever imposed on the U.S. economy. And uh, it was interesting to note, this was probably, I think, in the spring of 2015, that they had just sent the implementation guidelines to the states for the 2008 rule. Yet they were introducing a new rule, which they also admitted the technology didn't exist to achieve that, that standard. And there was an internal memo on the EPA that indicated that if we didn't do anything, we would achieve that standard in 10 years. How does that impact uh, uh, your economic planning, uh, uh, Ms. Keogh, in, in Arkansas? And then you can respond, Mr. Cabrera, afterwards. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, we happen to be one of the few states that now attain all the standards and even the proposed standard, but we did suffer greatly, a let particularly me, a low, let, small community. Let me interrupt community. you there. You've already achieved the standard without uh, the technology even though there's no te technology that really exists uh, that we, will allow we, other states to achieve that. You've already achieved it. That's correct. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, we had a small community, a rural community, that was being impacted who uh, models showed that in 10 years, and this was 10 years ago, that the area would reattain. Yet they were held under federal mandates to mm -hmm. under non-attainment for 10 years, held hostage to the local economic development interests until those standards and those technologies became fully in across uh, available across transportation and other sectors and so now that area does attain and that shows that the local area even though everyone knew 10 years ago that this was the solution the local area was harmed in that 10-year period the rules and the laws that undermine that or underpin that decision need to be changed to let local communities thrive while problems are being solved thank Mr. you chairman if i if i may i'd just like to follow up on that we you, talk about public health. time's expired, but you may follow up. Uh, thank, thank you for your indulgence, sir. Um, we've, we've had a lot of discussion about uh, the role of science and the EPA and, and, and improving public health. I'd just like to point out that some of the things that the EPA has done has cost thousands and thousands of jobs. And, and perhaps some, the, the best thing we can do for an individual or a family's health is a good paying job. And Ms. Keogh just gave an example of how heavy-handed EPA, even though they were achieving compliance, uh, it impacted their local economy in a very negative way. I thank, her, I thank the witness for her testimony. The chair recognizes a gentleman from Texas, Mr. Weber. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to have a statement that I want to read into the record, and I hope I have time for a question at the end of it. When I was in the Texas House, I was on the Environmental Reg Committee. Our colleagues across the aisle said you can't trust industry because all they care about is the almighty dollar and their bottom line. They don't care about people or their workers. So my response to them was, and still is, if you even wanted to assume for a minute they operate under the idea that the officers and the managers of a company don't give a hoot about their coworkers, which is such a salacious, ridiculous assumption, consider this. Were there to be a release, a fire, a spill, or any other such calamity that hurt people, their lives, and the environment, no one wanted that. It stops production, it costs lots of money in lawsuits, and it hurts people. Conclusion, of course the businesses, at least the overwhelming majority, are good actors. Uh, as for the bad actors, the states, particularly Texas, Texas has the TCEQ, Texas Commission on Environmental Equality, which I understand is the second largest regulatory agency in the world, second only to the behind the EPA. That agency will ferret out the bad actors and do everything we can to keep our neighborhoods clean and our people safe. To do anything less would be unthinkable. States should not be handcuffed by the expenses and the burdens put on them by the EPA. So this idea somehow that states won't take care of their people and their environment is a bogus one. If you'll pardon the analogy, it doesn't pass the smell test. But I guess if those on the other side need a straw man, then the big bad businesses will serve their purpose of a straw man, as long as that straw was grown with environmentally friendly fertilizer, if you'll pardon the pun. So that's the statement I want to get in the record because it's crazy that we somehow think industry should be held accountable. They don't really aren't intent on protecting people and keeping the environment clean. My question is for you, Ms. Kehoe. In what ways would you point out that show the EPA has been either has ignored Congress or the Constitution when it comes to the state's roles in implementing environmental regulations? In other words, the states have a role. Has the EPA ignored the Congress or the Constitution when it, use, I, in my opinion, usurps its authority and seeks to direct states to act outside their constitutional purview? Thank you for that very thoughtful question. Mm -hmm. We in Arkansas have seen that in real life uh, in the example of our regional Hayes plan where we've been uh, unable to affect a strong scientific and legal based document that was um, meeting all the requirements and yet we find ourselves 10 years later with no advance in pollution control but many dollars invested in legal discussions. That could have been used better off in, in the very uh, reason it was needed not in, instead of fighting the legal battles. Absolutely sure. and we understand it's important that our programs conform and comply with law and yet we work with EPA often and we find that the programs that we are focusing on are well beyond the legal requirements set forth in the in the, either the enacted law or constitutional basis. Let me point out how out of control the EPA has been in some instances. When I was in the Texas House, we had a Region 6 uh, EPA director um, there in the north part of Texas who had to, had to resign because um, a video was uncovered of him, I don't know, a year or two before he became region director. This has been going back five, six years now. In the video, they had a video of him saying that companies, industry, needed to be treated like the Roman gladiators did when they invaded a country. He literally said in the video, you, the Roman gladiators would come into a town and crucify the first five men they found and make an example of them. And he said, that's the way the EPA needs to do industry. Now, how does one justify that kind of mindset? It's gotten that prevalent in, in, in a regulatory agency that, in my opinion, is out of control, needs to be regulated by the states. I so appreciate, I think it was Mr. Cabrera's uh, statement that 40 years ago that was the case. States weren't there, but we've caught up. Did I mention that the Texas has the second largest environmental regulatory agency in the world, second only to the quote-unquote vaunted EPA? So I think it's time that we, we assume that people and agencies and states want to be good actors. They want to clean up their environment. They want to keep things safe for their people, and we ought to let them do just that. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to yield you back six seconds. Yeah, thank you.
Chair recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Higgins, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, I represent South Louisiana, the heartbeat of the oil and gas and petrochemical industry for the entire country, perhaps the world. Everything around us, the varnish on the table before you, the threads of your clothing are products of the petrochemical industry and oil and gas industry. No state, uh, I, I don't believe, has been, has been more injured by EPA regulatory overreach than the great state of Louisiana and the citizens that I represent. Uh, EPA overreach has been incredibly injurious to the hardworking men and women, real Americans, man, with lives, with mortgages, with car notes, with children in school. Uh, the, the impact of the EPA over the last eight years has been quite significant in the real world outside of the bubble of Washington, D.C. Mr. Cabrera, it's been noted here regarding the replacement of nine scientists at the EPA. According to my research, there are 94,600 environmental science jobs. That's from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. 94,600 environmental scientists in our country. Do you think perhaps they might be considered for those jobs or just the nine? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I, I believe in competition. I believe in diversity of ideas. Uh, I think that with competition and diversity of ideas, we get to uh, the best solutions. I concur. There are 7,500 to 8,000 graduates every year on average with environmental science degrees. Do you think perhaps they might be considered for those nine slots? Yes, sir. Thank you. Let's move on. During the since the inception of the EPA, there have been many presidents from and political ideological stances. Uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's, that's certainly a statement beyond debate. Do you believe that President Trump's decisions regarding the EPA are politically motivated from your perspective? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I, I would hesitate to try to understand Mr. Trump's, President Trump's motivations. Um, I can tell you that Administrator Pruitt's statements are in line with what the state of Arizona uh, and uh, uh, many, many states would like. Thank you. I bring this up because it would seem quite glaring that President Obama's administration uh, of the EPA was certainly politically motivated, any reasonable man would agree. The, under the Clean Air Act, the EPA can issue a federal implementation plan when a state fails to develop an adequate plan. An FIP is the most drastic and aggressive action the EPA can take against the state government. <coughs> President Obama, through his EPA, authored 56 federal implementation plans. The, the, previous, uh, the previous three presidential administrations issued five. So if we're going to talk about politics with candor and honesty amongst my colleagues, let us consider the fact that, that certainly as presidents change and administrative uh, endeavors change, the nature of federal regulatory agencies will also change. But there's been no more glaring example of political overreach and regulatory, uh, very destructive policies than under the last president. And I ask uh, Ms. Keough, am I pronouncing your name right? My sister Bliss was a valedictorian of her class in college with a degree in geology. She went on to serve Louisiana DEQ and retired. She's a brilliant woman. And I certainly respect the work of the states. I observed uh, from the inside uh, the extreme dedication from DEQ 
employees, dedicated scientists that uh, certainly were committed to protecting the environment. Our mind, the committee and those present, that we are a union of 50 sovereign states and that the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution states, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states or reserved to the states respectively or to the people. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair recognizes uh, the Vice Chairman of the Subcommittee, the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to each of you for being here today. Just a couple of follow-up questions. Um, Dr. Uh, Swackhammer, do you believe that there is a, a valuable level of diversity currently uh, on the uh, on the BOSC? Uh, so, and yet I do that. I do believe that there is, and that that diversity is expressed mostly in terms of the expertise that's on there, as well as the experience of the members of the BOSC. So we have members from uh, expertise in water engineering. Uh, toxicology, um, atmospheric sciences, uh, land sciences, um, children's health. Uh, so it's that breadth and diversity of expertise that is highly um, valued in any of these scientific committees, but particularly on BOSC right now. And just so I'm clear, the, the nine members who were uh, whose terms recently expired, who, which administration appointed those nine members? Uh, because they were there for three years, they were appointed under the Obama administration. Okay. However, I, I really want to say that we don't serve as, as if we're loyal to who appointed us. There's no loyalty to how we give science advice. It's not about who was appointed. I understood. Mr. Cabrera, in your experience of dealing with the boss, and you uh, four administrators over my time. There is no, it doesn't excuse matter me. who's Mr. Cabrera, in your experience of dealing with the boss, do you believe that there's been a, a healthy level of, uh, of diversity of thought, of ideology, of opinion on the boss from, from your... Uh, from your point of view? Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I, I have to admit that I have a precious little experience dealing directly with the BOSC. Okay, what about, what about you, Ms. Keogh? Um, I believe that we do need more diversity on that panel. In my 30 some odd years working in environmental policy, I have seen uh, the diversity aids the better decision making. So we have actually offered our own chief technical officer several times to be considered for that position. And I believe that as we broaden that audience of scientists, we get better input and better decision making and better policy out of our agencies. Thank you. You, you just answered my follow-up question. I don't want to date either one of you, but you, you have 30 something years of experience in the field. Ms. Keogh. Correct. Mr. Gabrera, how many years of experience do you have in your field? Over 20. Okay. Um, as, a, as a former state lawmaker, many, many of my colleagues in the committee also served in state legislatures as well. I'm, I'm intrigued by much of your, te your testimony already, Mr. Gabrera, about the, the, uh, the change over the 47 years since the inception of the EPA and the relationship between the states and the federal government. But in your 20-something year, years, uh, Ms. Keogh, in your 30-something years of experience, was there a point of, was there a period uh, during that time that you, you watched a, a, a quick change, maybe a tipping point? Was there a point in time where you saw that uh, ideological shift between the balance of the states and the federal government? Mr. Cabrera? In my experience, the attitude of collaborative federalism never really never really took hold the way it should have. Uh, I, I believe that there has always been a parent-child kind of relationship with EPA. Now let me say that I believe that EPA has a role and doing science for the nation is one of them. However, I, I do not think that the idea of collaborative federalism has ever been fully developed, and I'm excited about what I hear Administrator Pruitt talking about because I think he can actually get us there. So never a never a uh, sharp decline in that relationship, more of a slippery slope over time of, or, or, or do you believe it goes back to the inception that, 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 that cooperative federalism wasn't fully implemented at the beginning of the birth of the EPA? I think the approach has been consistent. The velocity at which decisions got made certainly accelerated during the last eight years. So the approach has always been parent-child, but the velocity at which decisions got made and imposed on the states certainly increased over the last eight years. Ms. Keogh, in your 30-something in your years of experience, would you, did the last eight years stand out as something that was 
uh, different, more, more conflict perhaps over the past eight years? Absolutely, I believe, uh, as the Congressman mentioned, and I previously testified to the Senate about the fact that we saw 10 times over the actions of federal plans over state plans in this last administration was telling and that we were being second-guessed uh, by this administration more than ever. And so I look forward to the opportunity to be not, not a pawn, but a partner again. And I, I do believe that previous administrations did uh, work to, with the states where, and to build the competency so that there could be a strong cooperative federalism. And I think we're ready for that, as others have mentioned, and we're re we stand ready to support environmental progress in a new day. Thank, Thank you. you. I yield back. Thank you. Um, the chair recognizes the long patient uh, gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to address a couple of comments that I've heard here in the exchanges. The uh, membership balance plan of the EPA acknowledges in its own document that it's about eight months worth of vetting and uh, review that's required. Uh, and I heard earlier that uh, perhaps we could do that in three months, but they indicate eight. And uh, with the uh, Constitution, I uh, just want to cite that Article One, Section 8 uh, the Commerce Clause provides for great opportunity, uh, provides the, uh, um, the given responsibility of broad powers to Congress in areas of environment and public health. Um, so again, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. Swackhammer, for sharing your critical perspective today and for continuing to deliver the resounding message that rigorous, credible science matters. I find your testimony to be refreshing. Uh, like you, I am alarmed by the recent dismissal of science advisory board members at the EPA, and especially with the stated intention of packing the board with industry experts. And a panel whose most significant responsibility is to evaluate science and public policy, independent scientists literally will not have a seat at that table. This dismissal of scientists and of science signals a dramatic shift toward federal policies that would put well-funded political and special interests ahead of the facts. The science that informs our national defense, health, economic, and other public policies that impact millions of Americans is under threat and by troubling action officially on notice. A few weeks ago, I spoke before a crowd of thousands in my district at the March for Science in Albany. I mentioned H.R. 1358, the Scientific Integrity Act. This bill would require science watchdogs in every federal agency involved in scientific research. As threats to independent, federally funded scientific research continue to grow, so must our ability to protect against them. The issue of scientific independence is not partisan. We have seen presidents and political leaders from both major parties attempt to influence government-backed scientific findings. The result is often the same, public policy that may not reflect the best interests of the American people. If we want our publicly funded science to be free, independent, and reliable, Federal science must be able to protect itself from political and industry pressures. World leaders have started to appeal to America's scientists and engineers by arguing that other nations value their work more than the United States does. This is a sign that America's global leadership in science and innovation may be weakening. This is not the first time science has been marginalized in America, but each time it finds a way to return and flourish as conditions improve. And it is not too late nor too hard for us to stand up now and safeguard our public science. So Dr. Swackhammer, you are not just a former professor of environmental health sciences, but are a professor emerita of science, technology, and public policy. It seems that the recent actions taken against the EPA's Board of Scientific Counselors to reduce the number of scientists on the board are not the only efforts taken by this administration to diminish the role of expert scientific advice that may interfere with their policy objectives. The Department of the Interior has suspended its science advisory committees. The Secretary of Energy's senior most scientific advisory board has not been reconstituted since President Trump's inauguration. And the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, or PCAST, can no longer be found on the White House's webpage. Our country has been built on a foundation of innovative science and technology. So, Doctor, do these actions concern you, and should they concern us? Well, um, I do think that there is a pattern here that uh, certainly, as an, as an individual, it causes me some, uh, I, I'm troubled by the pattern that I see the marginalization of science 
um, both within the, the top of the administration as well as within other agencies across the federal government, but I'm more familiar with, with EPA. I'm, um, I'm troubled by the fact that um, there is a, there's kind of a, they, there's, there's an intent to politicize and marginalize the science. And, you know, policy is by nature political. It is uh, the culmination, if it's good policy, it starts with science and it, 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 it gets influenced by many other things and often can end up being a political motivated policy. I understand that. But the science should never be politicized. And the, pop, the science should never be marginalized. And my fear, uh, my personal fear, is that the actions taken at the federal government are in fact diminishing the role of science. Certainly they're not celebrating the role of science all of the science offices um, in every major agency are unfilled. Um, the folks that have been put forward or floated, the names that have been floated for, for instance, the chief science officer at, at uh, the US Department of Agriculture um, has never, he has no degree or training in science, and yet he would be the chief scientist for USDA. These are the kinds of things that are part of a pattern that appear to be consistent with marginalizing the role of science in policy. Again, policy is, it, it's a mixture of things and it's influenced by many factors, but it should start with the bedrock of science, and I am a little fearful of that. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Lauderman. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the opportunity and everyone that's here today, and as I was listening to the previous testimony, I can tell you that from my experience, science is, is pretty absolute. The problem is it's our interpretation of that science to meet political ends, which has been happening since the dawn of man, and I believe it's going to happen. Our concern is are we using the science as fact, or are we using that science to achieve a, a goal? I'm, uh, as someone who grew up during the Apollo space race, I remember many scientists saying it was impossible with the data that we have to get to the moon. It wasn't the science that was wrong, it was our interpretation of that science. And we need to keep that in mind as we go forward and we deal with a lot of these issues because I would agree, we have politicized, especially the environmental uh, aspect of science, a lot of times to our own detriment. Mr. Cabrera, um, I'm a little still uh, amazed a little bit or trying to get my hands wrapped around the regional haze rule, which seems to be a major topic uh, that we hear about from the states. and. In, why would EPA impose billions of dollars in environmental controls to achieve improvements that you can't even recognize with the naked eye? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, many uh, would speculate that regional haze, along with clean power, um, along with several other rules, uh, were a um, bureaucratic approach uh, to deal with climate change. Uh, so um, many would speculate that uh, uh, while unable to pass any type of uh, climate legislation uh, uh, through Congress, uh, that the previous administration set out to use whatever tools were available uh, and uh, use them in such a way uh, that would uh, alleviate uh, climate change. Sure. What's the effect been, your state is Arizona, correct? Um, what has been the effect? Have you seen any improvements? What's the impact it's had on you as a state, as you as, a, as an official? Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, um, after 20 years, two commission reports, four lawsuits, two state plans, uh, a federal plan, uh, and an estimated cost of $500 million, uh, we will not see a perceivable improvement in visibility in the Grand Canyon State. $500 million, that's state funds? Uh, that's private industry installing controls on their facilities uh, to uh, um, eliminate pollutants that then create haze. So who ultimately pays for these controls? Is it, is it the industry? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, 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 members of the committees, it's likely going to be rate payers. Okay. The, which really is the most vulnerable of us. When you look at those that are on fixed income, and this is one of the issues I've had with politicizing 
uh, the environment is ultimately it is the rate payer that pays and the ones that hurt the most are the ones that already are trying to balance their checkbooks at the end of the month and they cannot afford another increase um, in their their rates and what ultimately happens in Georgia we do have some cold months and what will happen is people will shut their heat off to save electricity and they'll burn their fireplace which everyone knows is a it, it, it creates more pollution than the footprint of the coal-fired plant that's in our community um, dealing with ozone now I kind of segued into ozone what I understand there are exceptional events that uh, the EPA considers uh, with states. Um, how would you, can you explain briefly exceptional events and, and what is, it, how do you, how would you rate EPA's ability to identify exceptional events? EPA has done uh, some work associated with the sectional, exceptional events for dust and that work is solid. In fact, the state of Arizona was a leader uh, in that arena. For ozone, the problem is much more difficult. You are now dealing with some very complex photochemical models, uh, and EPA has not established clear guidelines on how exceptional events for ozone would be demonstrated. An exceptional event, by definition, is something that uh, is not created by industry or the lack of controls. It is created by something that is exceptional in nature. Um, a volcano, or in case of Arizona, a dust storm? Uh, at, uh, an ozone inversion due to weather conditions, yes. Does, so if the EPA doesn't record, do they do a good job of recording the events or, or do they not record them and, and how, what's the effect it has on your state? Mr. Chair Chairman, members of the committee, uh, it is up to the states to make the demonstration and then EPA has the ability to approve or reject the demonstration. So basically you have to go and prove that there was an exceptional event even if that exceptional event may have been a, a major incident that most Americans know about, then you have to go present that, your That's case? That's correct. That's correct. All right. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank uh, each of the witnesses today for being here with us and taking your time out to be with us and uh, your very valuable and interesting testimony. And also... This is the way it works. It's uh, down to the ranking member, myself, and Mr. Loudermilk. Uh, this, is the way, this is consistent, so I appreciate all the members and their questions as well. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments and written questions from members, and this hearing is adjourned.